we are so pleased uh, to be with Fred Steloff, who is, uh, I think, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful artist. Fred, let's let's start at the beginning. Um, when when did you realize and uh, that you were an artist? And I've always believed that artists are born. When did you realize that you were an artist? Well, actually, I. Uh, being somebody who was interested in solving problems, I thought I would have wanted to be a, a scientist. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, after uh, I got into the Army, uh, World War II, and uh, they, uh, they dropped the atomic bomb, right. I, I felt that the, there was something that disturbed me about uh, science that was able to be so destructive. So uh, when I came out of the army at the end of the war, I had difficulty integrating myself back into society. Right. And uh, I didn't think I was going to continue to be an engineer because I was studying engineering, oh. you see. So, so I thought I would be more interested in uh, perhaps being a, a composer of music. Right. But the composer of music is got to learn the language. And at my age and my personal abilities, I had trouble learning the language sufficiently well. And I realized, though, although I could render a piece of music right. on the piano with some poetry, that I had limitations because of my ability to learn the language. Right. As an aside, you know, mm -hmm. This you can take out of the, but the, all right, I see I've got an audience who's telling me <laughs> not to make any, any unusual comments. <laughs> so I thought that maybe as a, uh, as a painter, mm -hmm. I would have enough time to work in a measured way so that I would be able to create a right. visual work of art. So the problem solving that you that you thought that, that could be done as an engineer uh, would move toward music and then eventually towards right, the visual yeah. arts. Right. What about training, Fred? Uh, <coughs> after the war. Uh, well, after the war, I was entitled to uh, so many uh, months of training, which the government uh, allowed uh, veterans to have. The and GI Bill. The GI Bill, yeah. So I went to uh, Newark School of Fine and Industrial Arts, and I found two teachers who influenced my subsequent career. One was a German artist whose name was Hans Weingartner. And he was a, uh, a realistic painter, mm -hmm. but he was familiar with modern art. Right. And the other was a uh, sculptor by the name of Ruben Nakian. Very well-known sculptor. Yeah. Uh, the German painter had a certain discipline which he, I appreciated. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ruben Nakian was a poet. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a teacher, he was able to inspire me by his love of art. Mm -hmm. and. I think that's a difficult thing for a teacher 
to do. And uh, after my uh, three or almost four years at the, the school, I still had a sufficient amount of time which allowed me to go to France. Mm. Schools in France were informal. Okay. I mean, you went to a, an atelier or a studio, okay. and the, the master would come in once a week and uh, give you some criticism. So you were pretty much on your own. And I went to, to a place called the uh, Ecole, was it, the Grand Chaumier? Atelier de Grand Chaumier. Uh, okay. And, uh, and then I transferred to an atelier of Osip Zadkin, right? Okay. He was a sculptor. Sure. And uh, at the same time, uh, while uh, living there in France, I met uh, my future wife, and Jeanette. she's been a big influence. Mm -hmm. As I think about that period from, from 1945, the end of World War II, yeah. to about 1960, that's the period of abstract expressionism in, in the United States. Yeah. Um, so, and, and you, you talked about the, the rough edge and right. when I think about American abstract expressionism, it, it was pretty raw. Right. Y Europe, on the other hand, there's always that kind of sense of polish. Right. And so, so is that is that what we're talking about? The the difference between the the American attitude and then the, the age old European attitude of approaching. Bank? I don't think uh, when I said uh, uh, that I was going to go there to, for some polish. No. I, I perhaps uh, made the, the wrong term. I, uh, being a, a person with a good deal of introspection okay. in his, uh, in my personality, right. uh, I felt uh, that I was not suited in order to do what most people would characterize as abstract expressionism. Right. I didn't think I had the, the personality for the grand uh, gesture. There we go. Right? That we associate See, with Pollock and Klein well, yeah, and people yeah. like that. Yeah. I, I didn't. I figured that uh, I had to uh, be faithful to my what I thought was my personality, and my personality was not at that time open to these grand gestures. And uh, this kind of abstract gesture corresponds in a way to our American capitalistic structure. I mean, the work that I was doing hardly fit in into Chase Manhattan's building. <laughs> but I had to be honest with myself. And I think, as long as we are in this particular vein, that an artist can be dishonest in many other regards, but for him to be Truly an artist, he has to be honest with his work. Right. I mean, we, we talk about Caravaggio. He was many things, but I presume that he certainly expressed his personality through the honesty of his work, like it or not. Right. Right? Right. And so... I haven't tried to be somebody else. I'm really trying to be myself. And you always have. Well, there are influences, right? Sure, right? absolutely. I, Would you say uh, that, that some of the work that you were doing in France, uh, that, that post-impressionism, like the work of Cezanne, was an influence on you? I would say that Cezanne was an influence on me. And uh, I would say also 
that a good deal of the work in the uh, in the Renaissance, as I you know examined mm -hmm. history, uh, were influences, especially the work that had to do with light and color. Okay. See, I uh, I'm not really uh, a Michelangelo uh, sort of uh, follower. Right. Uh, not that I don't appreciate Michelangelo, but uh, if I had to pick, I would rather pick Titian. Okay. See? The, the, the and, Venetian. Uh, and the Venetian. And as it, you know, evolves into Valesquez and, uh, and to come to Cezanne, because Cezanne was interested in light and color, and as uh, he said, he wanted to give it the solidity of some kind of classicism. So when I hear, when I hear that Cezanne was a builder of form, right. I'm not sure that I really follow that explanation. For me, Cezanne was a poet, first of all, of color, light, and form. And that constitutes a real classical adaptation, which is in a tradition th that stems f from all these other artists who preceded him. And you know what? I think that if Cezanne were, were here right now, he would agree with you. Yeah. I think over time, we've, we've made Cezanne into something else, that the, he's this, as you say, this great formalist this, right. who was so interested in structure and abstraction. And the reality was that he was a dreamer. That's it. And it, in my opinion, his greatest works are his greatest dreams for light, color, and form. I mean, subsequently, I suppose some of his paintings that were a bit more tentative, which he probably never finished, have become celebrated as abstractions, perhaps. I, I don't know, you know. When it comes to the critical evaluation, right. uh, it's hard, it's, it's hard, it's right? I read the critics, and I don't always understand them, right? right? I, th I sometimes think that many critics write for other critics. You know? <laughs> they may write for other critics, and they may write in order to hear what they sound like. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, so, um, and then, so you're in, in France for a period of time in the 1960s. Yeah. And then you return to, to the United States. Uh, well, we had to return because uh, there were problems, you know. Uh, we, Jeanette, had a, a certain kind of a problem, and I thought, well, listen, uh, my dream of making a big, you know, commercial success, uh, we're not going to be fulfilled. Uh, In Europe. Yeah. To go back to uh, uh, some of our previous discussion, when I decided that, that finally that I was going to be an artist, I really gave up any ideas of really making a lot of money. You have to be a talented artist. You have to be a talented marketer. And sometimes the marketing takes over the, the <laughs> talent. <laughs> and so that's it. I, I mean, this is the nature of a thing. I was never under an, uh, the illusion that I was going to become a, a great marketer. Right. So what happened after that? Uh, we integrated ourselves in Jersey City, which uh, professionally probably was a mistake because if I had integrated myself in New York, right. things might have turned out <laughs> differently. Right. But uh, uh, that's, that's what happened. Uh, 
And uh, right. in order to uh, continue to do the work, I, I did some part-time work at the post office. Right. And, as uh, as a, a lot of artists uh, right, must yeah, do. Right. 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 Now, in in terms of the uh, of the work, uh, the early work was was representational and it had a certain social uh, comment uh, to it. The early work, it was uh, based on uh, on rep it was based on visual, you know, uh, information. Right. <laughs> and most of it, really was not realistic. There were a few examples of, okay. of realism which came from my German uh, instructor, okay. Right. Okay. but uh, I have constantly fought against the restrictions of realism. F for me to achieve some kind of poetry, I have to overcome the visual reality because the visual reality is effectively a prison and I have to break out of the, that prison. I'm not an expert on uh, Einstein but Einstein had to be some kind of a poet. He, he used his dreaming to overcome what apparently his eyes saw and only by dreaming could he visualize from the brain a different kind of a structure than what we see with our eyes. The same thing happened for me with the early work of the 1960s. Not being born with a fixed religion, in order to accommodate my view of the world, I had to sort of invent my own. And I, everybody really wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Right. Right? Right. So as I looked out on the f fruit and vegetables, <laughs> which everybody sees, I looked at them as if they were living things and that they and I and they shared this universe together. Right. That this enabled me to take a still life and strip it of its formal qualities and transform it in, into a vision that is more in the nature of pantheism, right? Mm -hmm. That means I took away the def decorative aspects of the fruit and the vegetables which were always used uh, in still lives and I gave it a, a life of a landscape which I thought, in my intuitive way, right. would enable me to escape into the greater, you know, world. Uh, it, the work became poetry. Poetry. But as we said, you know, I had to overcome the visual information mm. and let the brain come up with a different vision in order to come to this kind of pantheistic poetry. Right. In, in turn... Uh, excuse me. It is also a need to escape. Escape from the visual reality, right? Right. Uh, you know, and I, I think... It, I forget who said this, but the idea that, that the reason that humans create art is to create a kind of an artificial world to crawl into, 
when we when we have a hard time dealing with the real world, whether it's going to the movies or listening to a concert, or standing in front of a Fred Steloff painting, you you, you lose yourself. I would agree. It, I would agree to that. Yeah. Right. Um, the the work has has uh, changed naturally over time. How would you describe these various uh, changes from the early well, 60s, for well, example? Well, it's comforting to escape into this uh, dream world. Still and all, when we go out onto the street, we have to face another reality, right? Very true. I saw, you know, when I was in Paris, I saw a homeless lady who was lying down on a grill, you right. know, Great. a metal grill because uh, she was uh, homeless and, and, and cold. And uh, my visual uh, vision saw that, and uh, my brain registered it, and uh, I, uh, I felt a, a certain, you know... Empathy. Empathy for that woman, and... Uh, how would you uh, know it? But I had a, an artist who was a friend of mine who wasn't getting enough sleep. Mm. And his eyes were all red rimmed. So I decided I was going to make some kind of a portrait, a complete invention, right. in order to express this homeless woman and uh, the desperation would be in her hands, you know, mm -hmm. and with the uh, red rimmed right. eyes right. plus the color scheme and her hair, which is more like steel gray, that I could come up with a difficult enough rendition mm -hmm. in order to express. Right, right. I don't think it's very agreeable in there. I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't want to have it in their house. <laughs> <laughs> but it, huh? very powerful in terms yeah. of expressing your, your thoughts well, about it. We have a repetition over here on her sleeve of the Yes. Yes. I mean, all this, you know, is intuition, but then there is thought. Right. Absolutely. To be honest, you have to face that reality also. The other aspects of uh, my art are my efforts to deal with this other reality. It isn't always pleasant. And the uh, it, uh, it deals with the, the difficulties of, uh, of, uh, of the human condition, of living, and I keep on uh, vacillating from the difficulties which I feel compelled to be honest and face them to the uh, to the other uh, escape. So my personality seems to be divided by these two problems. And uh, I had a man who once said, well, he said, you know, life is too difficult to uh, to deal with that, we would rather escape. I mean, right. it's true we would rather, but still and all, we do have the problem. And as an honest artist, I think I have to make a statement about it. Right, right. Naturally, the, the painting was made before, before all of that. that. And, uh, I have subsequently others which were started before the World Trade Center 
and uh, which I have finished after the World oh. Trade Center. And, uh, and then, so uh, did you make them more literal then afterward? No, I didn't. No, okay. But uh, I did insert some slight suggestion of, uh, of human forms which uh, are not too easily seen. Right. Because uh, in spite of the the abstract nature of the work, right. I still feel that within these uh, structures that there is human life that could exist even though they are not always Understand. described. Understand. So in that way this work is Right. Not the same as Hans Hoffman. Right. The, uh, the, the 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 three three dark forms. Right. And then uh, the, the the lighter uh, yeah. forms, and then uh, the even warmer tones. Right. Well, these these are adding some kind of dimension. Decorative. It adds some kind of a, it's a relief from the dark. Okay. So without, you know, still in all, they do uh, have the same rigor, see? But I, I can't imagine the picture without having these other forms to complicate. To offset. Yeah, the, to the, offset the and complicate, the right? You know, um, as, you, as we look at your, the, your work, uh, go, going back in time to the yeah. most recent work, uh, there there are changes that that happen obviously as you change and your and your ideas change. But there is also a, a kind of a continuity. In the I work. keep on dragging my personality with me. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I, I have trouble, you know, leaving it behind. I have. Uh, come to the conclusion that the whole voyage of an artist is order, in order to discover himself. And, and as you uh, discover yourself, then you will discover the limitations that you have. And you will discover what and who you are. It's unlikely that I could ever be a Jackson Pollock because I don't think it's in my nature, you see? Right. So whatever I am... It reveals itself it re in the work. It reveals itself in the work. And the most important thing, I think, for an artist is to be honest with his work. It doesn't mean that he hasn't got influences, you know? He picks and chooses. But uh, if you want, if you have to be honest with your work, you cannot, I don't think that a real honest to good artist is going to look at the latest trends and adapt his work to that because it's a, he thinks he can sell. Right. That doesn't work. It isn't going to work for me anyway. Right. It may work for some, but it doesn't work for me. In, 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 the, in the, the process of making a painting, Fred, uh, um, I, I assume that there is a lot of intuition that, that goes into the process. It, I, would, I would say that starting with the, uh, the visual information right. and then the dreaming right. that gives you the vision of poetry that in order to achieve the final dream, that there is probably almost 90% intuition that brings you there. Now, the intuition 
needs to be restricted only in so much as you want to achieve some classical attitude to the final product. Right. Uh, if, if you are not interested in, in any kind of classical, at least, restriction on that intuition, then you are free to do, in a way, what Jackson Pollock did. Right. I don't know if he had any kind of classical restrictions on his work. He produced a poetry which I don't, in my, I don't believe that he had any idea of what would be the final product. And in some measure, I don't have any perfect idea of the final product either, as my intuition is given free reign. Right. But after I have arrived at what I think is a final product, my rational brain starts to examine it. And then there are some changes that take place. <laughs> well, your, your, your wife, Jeanette, uh, told me that, that there are works that you worked on years ago that you look at and decide to, to make adjustments to. Yeah, I'm very good for making revisions. Right. So I guess the question is, is a work of art ever finished? Do you, are you ever to a point where you say, this is finished? I try, I, I try, I <laughs> try. I think uh, there are some artists I've, I've read who don't want to see what they did <laughs> because it only makes them, you know. I heard de Kooning was like that, yeah, that he couldn't yeah. look at work that he had done before because he wanted to go in and change it. Every time I look at something that I've uh, completed, my rational brain wonders if there wasn't something else I could do. And this is, uh, it's almost like a, a torture, right? And some of these works that uh, we are talking about, which I thought were completed, <coughs> have been revised, and now I think they're completed. <laughs> okay. And. Uh, I hope so. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll never know for sure, uh, right? <laughs> uh. um, in, in, you know, years ago, uh, a friend of mine had a nice conversation with you, uh, Dr. Milton Greenberg. Oh, yes. And he, he asked a wonderful question, and I'm going to ask it. Uh, um, how, how does Fred Staloff want to be remembered uh, artistically? Well, I want to be remembered as a uh, as an honest artist, with all that implies, right? It really implies that you work for the poetry and not for the money, right. and that I don't think there is much else to add to that. If you are one of those fortunate artists that happens to make a great commercial success, so much the better. But sometimes those artists that make this great commercial success, that is really the end of their art. From there on, they become a prisoner of their commercial success. I don't think I can add much more. <laughs> <laughs> well. Well, we're really grateful for, for this time, Fred. Uh, we admire you immensely, and we certainly appreciate your sharing these very personal thoughts with us. Right. And as you uh, will see subsequently, you know, to the work that had to do with the, the demolitions, I returned to a more structured art of escape, okay. which is some of the final works. But I have never let go of the problems 
that have to do with the human condition. Uh, I brought them with me from the beginning, <laughs> and they uh, are still there in spite of all my efforts to escape. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, thank you very, very uh, much. Okay.